All right, so thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I put together a quick presentation here on um, the subject of IoT, more specifically the, the transformation of IoT over the last 15 years. Uh, what I did was I put together a presentation kind of uh, showing my experience of how IoT has changed over the last 15 years. Um, so with that, I will just go and start with a little bit about me. Uh, first, I graduated uh, Bachelor of Science Electrical Engineering from UNL in uh, 2002, a number of years ago. Uh, then I spent my entire career doing new product development uh, in different facets. Uh, you know, I spent some time being an electrical engineer, a lot of time being an electrical engineer, then I was an engineering manager, then I transitioned to product management, and then I went to director of product management. Um, so I've held a number of different positions over the years, all of them always focused on innovation, new product development. So um, I've worked for five different companies, contracted for two different companies. So I've done contract engineering work as well. The one thing that's common in all of these is that every company that I've ever worked for, they've had some requirement for an online device or an IoT device. Um, so what I wanted to do in this uh, presentation here is, is talk about those specific devices, to talk about uh, my experience with, with those, and I'm going to talk about it on two levels. I'm going to actually discuss both the technical and the business aspects, why a, a company decided to proceed forward with it or why they didn't decide to proceed forward with it, um, and then results and outcomes. So that way we can kind of learn from, you know, from the past. We can learn from what worked, what didn't work, what's changing in the environment. And then um, I'm going to do a more in-depth, uh, a deeper dive on a product that I brought to market, which is Ring Patrol, uh, which is an IoT device that I took to market. Um, and that, that discussion can be business or technical. I'm hoping that the, you guys, the audience, will uh, ask lots of questions and, and we'll take it whatever direction you want to take it. Um, then last but not least, uh, and this is kind of where the, the evolution of the 15 years comes in, I want to talk about the processors that are out now that are kind of IoT specific, what, what the manufacturers are doing to help uh, with the challenges, and then some, uh, some interfaces that I've been playing with recently because they're, they're cool and, and fun to play with. So my first job out of college in 2003, I worked for a company named Stanley Access Technologies, and we did the automatic doors uh, that you would see anywhere around Walmart, Home Depot, Walgreens, uh, Target, so on and so forth. Um, if you've walked through one of those doors recently, it's actually running the firmware that I wrote. Um, one of the first projects that we worked on uh, is they wanted an online automatic door. And this was 2003. This is before IoT was IoT. Industry 1.0 was there. You know, it it's precedes all of this. Um, there was a big push in the consumer market for smart home products, but none of them had really hit because of you know, the, the challenges associated with getting these products online. Well, when I was at Stanley, we decided that we would try a project to bring an automatic door online. And we started with the Williamsport, Pennsylvania Regional Airport. If you guys aren't familiar with, with Williamsport, it's the home of the uh, Little League World Series. So you have a, a city about the size of Lincoln take the volume of the city of Lincoln within a week. So that airport has to be very dynamic, very flexible. So their goals in doing this were to, uh, one, they wanted to be able to control traffic, right? They, when uh, the, the World Series isn't happening, they wanted to be able to section off portions of the airport. Uh, the second thing is they wanted to monitor door status. Uh, believe it or not, when you hit those doors with a piece of luggage, they can go into an emergency mode and then they don't work anymore and that's, that's a problem. So they wanted to be able to monitor that and to be able to, um, to, to go reset them when necessary and make sure the doors are functioning property, properly. Uh, the third thing is you'll see uh, in this, on this back piece, or the, the top sensor piece right there, there's actually a video camera in the sensor, and that's there for a couple of reasons. One, they're actually doing some safety video processing uh, to make sure that the, the space is safe before the door closes. But the second one is for security reasons and liability reasons. They want to make sure that if somebody gets hit by the door, they can, they can prove that that happened or they can prove that something else happened. So they wanted to vi view the video remotely. 
And then, uh, like I said before, they want to be able to lock terminals remotely. Um, so that was the, the goal. And again, we installed that in August of 2003. And it was a, a successful project. It was a very uh, intense project at the time. Um, and mostly intense because uh, there weren't many options for bringing devices back online then. What we used at the time was we used a product called uh, a Lantronix, and it wasn't called Export then. I don't remember what the, um, what the name of it was, but it was basically a serial to an Ethernet converter. It ran a, a very simple version of Linux that would serve up a web page. And so basically what we did was we developed uh, a web page that allowed us to command and control the control system of the door. We also included an iframe so that they could see what's happening real time at the door while they're doing it. So um, like I said, we, we have control. So in, in controlling it, we have a remote activation if they needed to, to send it open. Um, they can lock and unlock that door. Again, if they wanted to section off a piece of the terminal, they could do that. They could change modes. So for example, you can change a door to a one-way mode only. So people approaching it from one side can go through, but not the other way. So they can change the traffic to one way. They can make it bi-directional, or they can actually deactivate the sensors and make it so it's access control only for like a, a swipe card or a, an RFID sensor. Um, and then uh, we also added the capability to notify if there's motion around the sensor. So for example, if they wanted to put it in the, the terminal in lockdown mode, uh, the sensors themselves could notify the users that somebody was there and so they could pull up the video and say, hey, what's going on here? You know, is it, is it a mom changing a diaper or is it somebody trying to be somebody, somewhere they're not supposed to be? So um, it was, uh, from a technical perspective, it was actually a really interesting project, a really difficult technical project, because there wasn't a lot of precedence from a technical perspective for doing something like this. Um, the airport was actually really happy uh, that, that they were able to have this sort of technology, and we were happy to, to do this technology. But ultimately, it was a flop. It was a failure to launch from a product perspective. So the question is, why? What, what happened? A couple things. Number one, those embedded devices back then, they were really costly. Those serial to Ethernet modules were on the order of $80 a piece. So it was, it was very costly, which Williamsport Airport could handle, but you, know, you can't get that mass adopted. The second thing was that it was Ethernet only. There was no Wi-Fi, which means that you had to pay somebody to pull cable all the way to the doors. And the doors, you know, if you kind of walk around the building and look at doors and pay attention to them, which, which unfortunately I do now, I pay attention to, to doors. Uh, but if you look at them, they're always in a spot that's not convenient for pulling wire. So that became a real challenge. The other thing is local access only, meaning that um, you know, if you're outside of your, your local network, you couldn't get access to it. Now that was kind of by design, right? It, from a technology standpoint, you could go outside of the network, but the next point is why we didn't, because there was no SSL, right? There was no encryption, there was no, these by, uh, embedded devices were just um, really um, not very smart devices. Uh, you know, for, for making the door a smart door, it wasn't a smart device. So, um, there was a lot of really big challenges there, which made it okay for these one-off projects, but it, it made it so that we could never get mass adoption. It was always something cool that we could talk to customers about, but it was never something that they said, okay, let's do it. And the last thing here is that the, the, one of the things that we were going after at the time was maintenance contracts, right? So instead of having somebody say, hey, my door's broken, um, can you come fix it? What we were trying to do was say, all right, if we can monitor this thing online, we know how many cycles it has, we can monitor currents, we can monitor temperatures, we can monitor all of this stuff, we'll dispatch a technician before you even know. The problem was nobody was ready for that, nobody trusted that, and nobody knew how to monetize that. And um, you know, I'm kind of pointing out this uh, with this project, but with all of the other projects that I've worked on, IoT and industry, that's kind of the main theme, um, is that it, you know, different companies, same story. We want to measure things, we want to control things. From a control perspective, for the most part, it was always a, uh, a novelty. It wasn't ever something that was super critical to control. When it's all about measurements, people will say things like, hey, 
um, shouldn't your product work anyways? I mean, you should be designing it to a level of control that I don't have to call you that often anyway, so I'm not paying extra for this. You're just gonna make sure it works. So with, with Stanley, uh, with another company that, that I worked for, uh, Teledyne SeaTac, we had the same problem. Even at Conductic Swanfler, we, we talked about the same things. You know, you want to measure things in the field. How do you charge a customer for you? How do you, how do you charge a premium for that? And I think that that's the biggest challenge that a lot of companies have, especially with um, the, the sheer cost of everything. So that's kind of been my history in the past. Now moving forward, I did find an idea that I felt like was monetizable and was a good idea, and that's how I came up with the idea of Ring Patrol. So Ring Patrol was an idea that, that I came up with. Actually, I don't get all the credit. My wife came up with it. She gets all the credit. But it's a concept where you use an embedded device, um, a, a connected device, to in, in order to make a very, um, you know, a very archaic part of your house a little bit smarter. And that part is your doorbell. And so in describing the solution, I wanna start with the problem. The problem is that the current residential doorbells are very archaic and they're very disruptive, especially to a mom with young babies. In fact, you know, you see these funny post-it notes that I put on this slide. Um, there are tons of, of different funny blog posts about moms who basically say, if you wake up my baby, you have to put him, you have to put him back to bed. Uh, anybody who's had a child knows for sure that, that it's a challenge. The baby wakes up, the mom wakes up, the dog wakes up, it's a problem. So the question here is, well, well how do I know? Well, I've got four little girls. I mean, I've lived this. My wife uh, came up with this idea when she was pregnant with number three. The, the oldest two were napping still, and, you know, UPS, they showed up at the exact wrong time. They show up at two o'clock and ring the doorbell and uh, wakes everybody up and it just kind of throws the whole household off. But here's the thing, it's not, it's not just parents, like right? that, that's where we started, but it's anybody who has a modified sleep schedule, right? Doctors, cops, nurses, firemen, uh, factory workers who work second and third shift. Uh, but also you'll see I've got a dog up there. So about 50% of my customer base right now are people who have dogs that just, that they can't stand barking at the door. Um, and then uh, the last picture here is a, a guy doing ding dong ditch, right? So when you're in high school, you love to prank the neighbors by hitting the doorbell and running away. So um, anybody who has uh, that sort of scenario where they really wanna protect their household from, uh, from the doorbell. One other use case, and this is actually a really good one, is uh, for people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Uh, right now, their current solutions are, are really archaic, right? You can, you can have a flashing strobe light, which is great, except for you have to be in the room to see it. Um, you can do a wireless solution, uh, which is honestly what most of them do, but they have a limited range, suffer from interference, require batteries, requires you to stay on top of it. And then there's some other uh, more techie solutions, but a lot of those are very expensive. They require you to have a dedicated phone line, um, and again, are wireless and, and have limited range. So I was thinking, wouldn't it be nice if you had a solution that could just automatically schedule silent times and send notifications directly to your smartphone, right? Be, be notified when you want to be notified, how you want to be notified. Don't do it on somebody else's terms, do it on your own terms. Um, and if it existed with, or worked with your existing doorbell, was super easy to install, super cost effective, and there weren't any recurring monthly costs with it. So that's where the idea of Ring Patrol came about. The solution is simple. It's just a simple device that wires in with your existing doorbell and it basically monitors the existing button and it uh, controls when the chime is allowed to ring and when it's not allowed to ring and allows you to schedule it, right? So if you've got uh, nap time every single day that the baby's sleeping, schedule it every single day. If you've got um, you know, a modified shift because you're a nurse and you work three days on, you know, four days off, you can set up the schedule per day and it will automatically remember. So there it is. You can silence the doorbell on your schedule. It's all done through the app. Um, you just set it up through the app and then you get notifications through your phone. So again, you get notified on, on your terms, not somebody else's. So again, just kind of recapping, um, you get automated schedules, you get multiple schedules. Again, if you've got kind of flex schedules, 
notifications, accessibility, but ultimately it's peace of mind. And this is the one thing that my wife said about, um, about the product is that it just, it, it relieved her of her anxiety, right? She would hear a truck going down the street and she would jump up and run to the door to make sure the postman didn't ring the doorbell. And it just relieved her of all of that anxiety. So what about the competition? Well, let's be honest. The, the biggest competition for this product is actually the post-it note. A lot of parents think that they can put a post-it note over the doorbell and have that work. But I've heard over and over and over again that the post-it note blows away, it fades, it washes away in the rain, or people just flat out ignore it. I mean, there's, we've got really pushy uh, uh, internet salesmen here in Omaha. Um, they love to just, oh, didn't see it, ding dong. Um, and so people don't use it. There's another product called the Knock Nanny. Um, honestly, it, it hasn't been very active, but it's just a piece of plastic that slides over. It doesn't have scheduling, right? You have to actually remember to go put it over your doorbell in order for it to be functional at all. And then on the high end, you've got the video doorbell solutions. Now, this is the thing that people ask me about the most, right? What about Ring? What about Skybell? What about Nest? What about da 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 da? You know, the other 30 competitors out there. And quite honestly, they do a different function those video doorbells, they actually focus on security and they say that. They want to give you caller ID at the door and they want to give you security. My product focuses on serenity, right? It differentiates itself in that way. So, um, and, and actually with all the technology that these guys have, none of them have implemented any scheduling uh, to turn off the doorbell. Ring uh, just came out with something where they allow you to not be notified of motion alerts, but that's different. If somebody hits the bell, it still, it still rings. So nobody actually, I mean, I say competitive landscape because people group it this way in their minds, but there really actually isn't a competitor for the product. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about the challenges. I categorized them in four major buckets. One was customer exploration. That was a huge challenge because um, people have to you have to try and get the answer out of somebody whether they have this problem or not. And, and this isn't a problem that people can conceive a solution for, right? It's, it's not something that somebody considered there was a solution for. Um, there's logistical challenges. Uh, again, I'm, my target persona is a really tired mom, you know, who doesn't have a lot of technical experience. So from a technical pers or a logistical perspective, she's gotta be able to really easily install it. And then traction. Um, there's a lot of really big traction related challenges, getting this accepted into the marketplace. Because again, you know, millennials don't use doorbells and uh, most people haven't conceived of, of a solution. Okay, so let's talk very specifically about technical challenges. And again, interrupt me if you have questions. I actually designed this more for an interactive discussion rather than me speaking the whole time. Um, so, and there's not a ton of this presentation left, so interrupt me, ask questions if you have them. Uh, but basically, one of my first technical challenges is how do you control the chime and monitor the button? If you kind of remember back to that wiring diagram I showed earlier, uh, it's basically all in series, right? So if you just use a relay and cut, um, cut it out of the circuit, then you can't monitor the button anymore. So that was one of the really big challenges, and the reason why you want to do both is because you want to get that notification piece too. The other great reason for doing that is if you just use a relay and cut the doorbell out, the, if you have a lit up doorbell button, that goes away and somebody pushes on it and they think it's broken. If it's lit up and they see it changing color, then they know it's not broken, so they don't knock instead. Um, the, same, the second one is, uh, how can I make this affordable so anyone can adopt this technology? And this has always been one of the biggest challenges of IoT. You know, processors are expensive, especially processors that will uh, connect well to the internet and have enough power to, to have a, um, the IP stack that you need to connect to the internet. Um, so this was a, a really big challenge for me and I stumbled across something that we'll talk about here in a minute that actually was kind of the secret sauce in terms of cost. It was a really low power, sorry, low cost, high power microcontroller um, that, that made it so that a start, startup could do this pretty easily. Um, the first, the third thing was how to do initial installation without a UI, right? So you have a, a device that needs to connect to Wi-Fi and the device itself doesn't have any user interface on it, so how do you do that? 
And I did it kind of in, a, in the same way that um, a lot of devices do. Like if you have an Amazon Echo or you know, one of those types of smart devices, basically when you first power them on, they come up and they put up an access point. You connect to that, set up the configuration, and then it can connect to your network and you're fine. So that's effectively how I did it with this. Uh, and there were some challenges uh, doing that with a very low cost microcontroller, uh, but I was able to get through those. And uh, push notifications. So since we wanted to, to notify uh, Apple and Android phones through their native interface, um, you know, they kind of rely on a, I don't know if anybody's looked at the API for that, but they have a, a pretty rigid API on how you send push notifications. One of the most rigid parts is that it has to be 256-bit encryption. So you've got an 8-bit microcontroller <laughs> that you've got to create a 256-bit uh, encryption with. That, that was a huge challenge, being able to do that and being able to do that quickly. So that was a, a major challenge, a major hurdle that I came over. Um, and then, uh, you know, like I talked about before, how to simplify installation so that anybody can do it. Again, you're, you're, my target persona was a tired mom, baby's not napping, um, you know, and, and she just wants a little relief. So I, I had to make it simple enough that she can do it. Um, so that's, that's it. And the nice thing about uh, really hard technical challenges is that that's where you get your IP from, right? So I have a patent on this product, and a lot of the a lot of the the meat of the patent comes from the technical challenges that I faced while I was doing this. Any questions so far? Nope. Okay. So I'm gonna end on Ring Patrol on a quote that, that is my favorite because as entrepreneurs, we spend a lot of time hustling, <laughs> which means you're exhausted. But uh, the quote basically says, no day is so bad it can't be fixed with a nap. And uh, with Ring Patrol, I basically uh, took on the slogan, uh, save the naps, right? That's, that's the whole concept of the product. Um, I did bring one with me so everybody can kind of see how it works. Uh, this is my little uh, demo display board. And I can just plug it in if everybody kind of wants to, to look at it. But again, uh, your traditional doorbell system on a, on a standard house comes with three components. The button that's on the front of your house, the chime that everybody sees kind of mounted in their front hallway, and then the transformer. And the transformer is what powers the whole system. So basically, in this scenario, you have two wires going to the transformer. What Ring Patrol does is it actually, you pull those two wires off, You've got two power wires that go onto the transformer, and then the remaining two wires connect to the two wires that you pulled off of here with these two wire nuts. Uh, su super simple installation. The nice thing is it's all AC voltage, so polarity doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter as long as you get one wire here, one wire here, and then same thing on the other side. So that's, that's as simple as it is, and the way, and the way it works is uh, it's just got a little removable adhesive, plop it wherever you have uh, space and connect it to your Wi-Fi and you're up and running. You have the ACDC converter inside of the Yep, yep. And I have to make it, um, that was again another challenge because these transformers over the, the many years that they've made doorbells have changed. Anything from eight volts AC up to 24 volts AC. So. Uh, that's a pretty wide range, um, and so the switching power supply inside had to, had to convert to, to DC and then switch down to a voltage that the processor could use. And it had to clean it up quite a bit, too. So, yep. Any other, any other questions? You can talk about what processor you're using in that Yeah, we, we absolutely can. Um, oh, yeah, actually, it's on the next slide right here. So um, this is where I kind of got into new technologies and processors. Um, there's two that uh, hold a special place in my heart. The first one is the one that I'm using in this product. Um, the first one is called an ESP8266. There are many variants of it, and you've probably all heard of, of this product. Um, I'm using a, a pre-certified module. And the reason why I did that is because um, when you sell a product in the US, you have to certify it to FCC standards. If you use a pre-certified uh, module, then you don't get past that, but it makes it, it, makes it a thousand times easier. 
the cost of doing an FCC certification was, you know, somewhere around $1,500 rather than 10 grand. And when you're a startup, that, that makes all the difference in the world. Uh, but there's several other great things about this processor. One is the low cost, right? They're, they're sub $3. And actually, when I buy them in volume, I can get them closer to two, uh, about $2.40. So they're very inexpensive for a 80 megahertz processor with a 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi Phi, the physical layer, and it comes with um, two meg, two meg of, of internal memory that you can use to serve up web pages. So, again, when you compare and contrast over the last 15 years, uh, a lot has changed from, you know, the old serial to Ethernet devices that were $80 and had very little power, to what you can get now. It is it is incredible. Um, the other nice thing about this is that it uses the popular Arduino environment, which means that there's tons of libraries, tons of community, tons of support. I actually don't use most of the libraries because you know some of the stuff that I do is kind of mission critical, and I'm and I'm very familiar with embedded C, so I happen to write a lot of my own C and C++, uh, and and because I need it to be very stable. But if you're doing a hobby project or you're developing something uh, for proof of concept. It is, a, it is a very inexpensive, very powerful solution. Uh, one of the other ones that I kind of pointed out here is a, a Texas Instruments processor. It's their CC3220. Uh, and they have a couple of them, right? They've got a series of it depending on what you want. Um, the thing that's really cool about these processors is that they are Wi-Fi certified. So they're, they're certified by the Wi-Fi Alliance. Um, they have hardware encryption, decryption. So all those pains that I was talking about with, with doing the SHA, uh, the SHA 256 encryption, blah, 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 those algorithms, all of those pains that I went through, this just takes care of for you. And uh, since it offloads it onto a coprocessor, your application isn't slowed down at all by that, that cryptography. So uh, you know, for a couple more bucks, man, you get a way better processor. The other thing is uh, it's got a Wi-Fi coprocessor. So all the time that um, the processor spends you know, in the Wi-Fi stack uh, is spent elsewhere. It, it's not taking up your application code. So with those couple of things, that it makes this processor like 10 times faster than the one that, that I'm using. So, so yeah, that's, that's a specific processor I'm using. It's not the one I have pictured here. I have a, a pre-certified module that actually comes directly from the manufacturer. One of the challenges with these ESP8266 uh, is, is that there are a variety of manufacturers and you get a variety of quality uh, in terms of the antenna, um, the, uh, the processor, the memory chip, the speed of the memory chip. The, there's a bunch of variability that you have to kind of look out for there. But I bought it directly from the, the manufacturer of the chip, and so you know, pre-certified, it's uh, it's met all the specifications. So it's been a very solid choice for uh, for Ring Patrol. Um, one other thing that I thought I would talk about from a technology perspective is, you know, once you have all this information, how do you display it? And and I think uh, I kind of stumbled across this product called ThingsBoard. Um, I don't know about four or five months ago. And, and I'm going to be honest, I don't have a use for it with Ring Patrol, but I think this is cool, so I had to share. Uh, but basically what this is, is this takes all of the different modules that you need for an IoT device and smashes it into one, right? So if you look at uh, Google or Azure or um, AWT, or yeah, AWS's IoT offerings, they basically have a, a complex hierarchy of how the data comes in, like who's listening for the data, the, the broker. They've got an, a hierarchy for lots of different things, right? All the way from, from message coming in to where it gets stored in the database and how it gets processed. ThingsBoard isn't uh, anything new. It just takes all of those and packages them in one component. So what they've done is they've actually taken the broker, the database, and the visualization piece and package it all in one product. Another cool thing about these guys is that um, they have an open source version. So as long as you want to install it on your own Linux server, you can run it yourself. Um, you only have to pay for it if you want to white label it, if you want to brand it as yours. Uh, but the rest of it is, uh, is open to use. 
From a device communication standpoint, they're pretty flexible. You can use an HTTP, HTTPS, MQTT. They've got a secure version of the MQTT. Co-app, um, which they said none of their customers are using because it hasn't gotten wide adoption yet. The other thing is they've got integration with lots of external services. So if you want to do post-processing, AI processing, um, anything like that, then, uh, then you can do that. I also wanted to throw up a dashboard. This is one of the ones they had as an example on their website. So they've actually got plugins for all of their widgets. So all, each one of these blocks right here is a different widget in their software. So they've got a Google Maps API plugin, so you can, you can plot your sensors on a map. Um, they've got all different, all different kinds of graphs uh, and, and you know, different logs and things like that. And then they've also got real-time alerts and monitoring, and you can uh, actually trigger reports out of this piece of software. So pretty, pretty powerful piece of software. Um, I've, I've played around with it a little bit, and I'm quite intrigued with, uh, with what's going on here. But I uh, thought I would share it with everybody because I know we're a room full of tinkerers and uh, thought other people might be interested in checking it out. So they have a built-in Cassandra database. Yeah. Yeah, and you can, you can actually split the data. They've got this really cool thing on the front end. It's called a, um, uh, I knew I was going to forget the name as soon as I brought that up, uh, a rule chain uh, editor. And it, you can kind of draw where the data goes when it comes in. So you can silo data. You can copy data. You can, you can make database copies if you wanted to. Let, let's say you wanted uh, a shadow copy to an external database and you want to keep some of your data in, in an internal database, you can do that. You can set up triggers and alerts. Um, so basically, anytime any data comes in on that HTTP, MQTT, or co-op protocol, you can define what happens to it after that. Any other questions? That's all I have. Thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.